the lives of many American presidents contain lesser known, but fascinating facts that we seldom learn in school. Take Teddy Roosevelt. Before he became president, he felt burned out for a while and moved out west to become a rancher. There an armed and dangerous bar bully picked on the bespectacled Teddy Roosevelt, called him four eyes, and tried to push him around. It did not end well for the loud. Following are 20 things about that and other lesser known facts about American presidents. The president who went from sickly child to tough hombre. America's 26th president, Theodore Teddy Roosevelt, was a sickly child whose frequent bouts of ill health made his parents fear that he would never make it to adulthood. The son of a Manhattan socialite and a businessman philanthropist father, young Teddy often suffered severe nighttime asthma attacks that the best doctors could do little about. As he described the bouts in later years, they felt as if somebody had sat on his chest and tried to smother him with pillows. A born fighter, Teddy did not despair and discovered a means to help him keep down the asthma and simultaneously keep up his spirits, vigorous exercise. When he was around 11 years old, Teddy traveled with his family to Europe, and as they hiked in the Alps, the sickly kid discovered that he could keep pace with his father. It felt pretty good, and from then on, Teddy adopted a regimen of strenuous exercise and outdoors activities. He also took up boxing in order to learn how to fight, after he got bullied by two older boys on a camping trip. When Teddy Roosevelt decided to give up politics, Teddy Roosevelt went to Harvard where he boxed and rode. He was good enough at the former to make it to second place in a Harvard boxing tournament. After Harvard, Teddy spent a year at Columbia Law School, before he dropped out in 1881 to serve in the New York State Assembly. His political career showed early promise, and he made a name for himself, especially in his efforts against corporate corruption. Then came 1884, a truly terrible year for the future president. On Valentine's Day, February 14, two days after she gave birth to their daughter Alice, his wife died, his mother followed her a few hours later. The only entry on his diary that day was an X, and the notation the light has gone out of my life. That summer, he attended the GOP National Convention in Chicago, but his candidate lost. The personal and political setbacks in quick succession caused Teddy to feel burned out, so he decided to quit politics and move out west. He had visited the Dakota Territory in 1883 to hunt buffalo, and fell in love with the Western lifestyle. So he invested $14,000 a significant amount in those days to become a rancher. Teddy Roosevelt and the Bully Teddy Roosevelt was more than just a rich guy from the East Coast, who went out west to play cowboy. In the summer of 1884, he established the Elkhorn Ranch on the banks of the Little Missouri River in the Badlands, about 35 miles north of what is now Medora, North Dakota. He enthusiastically embraced his new occupation as a rancher, and set out to learn the ropes literally of the profession. He learned to ride, rope cattle, and hunt and wrote three books about his experience. Later that year, Teddy Roosevelt went on a days-long horseback ride to clear his head, and take in the scenery, and eventually came across the Nolan Hotel in Mingusville, Montana. The place looked like a seedy dive, and T.R. was reluctant to enter, especially after he heard a pair of gunshots coming from the bar. However, nightfall was near and it and it was cold outside, so he went in. He saw a shabby individual in a broad hat with a cock gun in each hand was walking up and down the floor talking with strident profanity. He had evidently been shooting at the clock, which had two or three holes in its face, as soon as he saw Teddy who wore glasses. The loud hailed him as Four Eyes, and announced to the bar that Four Eyes is going to trade. The future president tried to play it off as a joke, but the loudmouth followed him around. As seen below it did not end well for the loudmouth. Teddy Roosevelt's Bar Fight As Teddy Roosevelt described his encounter with an armed bully in a Montana bar, as soon as he saw me he held me as four eyes in reference to my spectacles, and said, four eyes is going to treat, I joined in the laugh and got behind the stove, and sat down, thinking to escape notice. He followed me however and though I tried to pass it off as a jest this merely made him more offensive, and he stood leaning over me, a gun in each hand, using very foul language, in response to his reiterated command that I should set up the drinks, I said well if I've got two, I've got two and rose, looking past him. As I rose I struck quick and hard with my right just to one side of the point of his jaw, hitting with my left as I straightened out, and then again with my right. He fired the guns, but I do not know whether this was merely a convulsive action of his hands, or whether he was trying to shoot at me. 
when he went down he struck the corner of the bar with his head a euro broken bar if he had moved I was about to drop on my knees, but he was senseless. I took away his guns and the other people in the room, who were now loud in their denunciation of him, hustled him out and put him in the shed. The next day, the humiliated lout left town on a freight train. The huge events in President Lyndon Johnson's administration obscured his quirky side. If it had not been for the Vietnam War America's 36th president, Lyndon Baines Johnson might have gone down in history as one of the country's greatest chief executives. He had spent decades in Congress, both in the House and Senate, whose majority leader he became in the 1950s. When fate elevated him from vice president to president after John F. Kennedy was assassinated in 1963, LBJ entered the Oval Office with an unequaled mastery of the legislative process. He put that expertise to good use and pushed through landmark legislative accomplishments, such as the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Both Medicare and Medicaid also began during the, his administration. Had Vietnam not derailed his ambitious Great Society program, LBJ would probably rank alongside Franklin Delano Roosevelt as one of America's most transformative presidents. The disastrous war in Southeast Asia and the great legislative accomplishments loom large in LBJ's public perception. They obscure a scene below the lesser known quirky and sometimes seedy side of the man. The intersection of LBJ's humor and his amphibious car. LBJ liked to depict himself as a simple a good old boy, and in many ways, he really was, a good old boy, that is there was nothing simple about the smart as a whip Lyndon Johnson. One way the good old boy side came out was in his humor. Not subtle salon or New Yorker type quips and bon mot, but down to earth and quite often earthy jokes and pranks, the darker the better. One of his favorites was to convince guests, whose numbers included important foreign dignitaries, that they were about to die. He pulled it off with his Amphicar, a West German vehicle, that was the only civilian passenger amphibious automobile to ever be mass-produced, about 4,000 were made, and President Johnson was the proud owner of a baby blue one. When LBJ visited his Texas ranch, he often invited people down to spend some time with him as his guests, while there the host would often take them for a drive in his Amphicar, without telling them what it was. As seen below he would then convince them that they were about to drown, one of President Johnson's favorite practical jokes was to convince people that they were about to die. As President Johnson drove guests around the Texas backcountry in his amphicar, when he came close to a lake or pond, he would suddenly pretend to have lost control of the vehicle, then to the terrified guest's consternation, he would drive straight into a body of water. As the car splashed into a lake and the terrified passengers screamed, and perhaps soiled their pants as their lives flashed before their eyes, Johnson doubled over with laughter. As one mark of the practical joke described the experience the president, with his secretary Vicky McCammon in the seat alongside him and me in the back, was now driving around in a small blue car with the top down. We reached a steep incline at the edge of the lake, and the car started rolling rapidly toward the water, the president shouted, the brakes don't work, the brakes won't hold. We're going in, we're going under, the car splashed into the water. I started to get out. Just then the car leveled and I realized we were in an amphicar. The president laughed. As we putted along the lake then, and throughout the evening, he teased me. Vicky, did you see what Joe did? He didn't give a damn about his president. He just wanted to save his own skin and get out of the car. Then he would roar with laughter. Lyndon Johnson was obsessed with his Johnson. Another lesser known fact about President Johnson is that he was obsessed with his well Johnson, not as in he could not keep it in his pants he could not, in more ways than one, but that is not the point. LBJ was always eager to let those around him know that, he had an unusually large male member, that would not have sat well in the Me Too era. A competitive womanizer, LBJ often banged the table and bragged that he had more women, by accident than JFK ever had on purpose, whenever people mentioned his predecessor's numerous affairs, Today, the sheer number of predatory assault allegations LBJ's conduct invited would probably force a presidential resignation, at least if he was a Democrat president or a TV one. From early on, Johnson was notorious for creepy mannerisms that skeeved out people, especially in Capitol bathrooms. If a colleague entered while he was at the urinal, LBJ would often swing around, with his private still in his hand, and whirl it around as he hooted, Woo-ee! Have you ever seen something as big as this? 
Johnson would then begin to discuss pending legislation, even as he continued to brandish and shake his Johnson, the man simply had no humility when it came to his manhood, which he called Jumbo. President Johnson liked to work his Johnson into every conversation. LBJ was earthy in many ways, in an alpha male ritual of primacy assertion, he obliged aides, both male and female, to take dictation as they stood in the door of his office bathroom, while he urinated or defecated. Even on the floors of the House or Senate, Johnson would often rummage away extravagantly at his crotch, and frequently reach through his pockets to better position Jumbo so its outline could show beneath his pants. He constantly tried to work size boasts into conversations, as a clip from the LBJ tapes, which recorded a phone call with his tailor illustrates, another thing the crotch down where your pants hang, it's always a little too tight, so when you make them up, give me an inch that I can let out there, because they cut me. Johnson had a special nozzle installed in his White House bathroom, and had it positioned so it would shoot water directly at his privates while he showered. He refused to listen to arguments from the White House staff, that the installation of the special nozzle would require a great deal of plumbing work, and insisted that it be done anyhow. As President of the United States, he of course had his way. As he told the staff, if I can move 10,000 troops in a day, you can certainly fix the bathroom any way I want it. Abraham Lincoln could probably kick your butt. Abraham Lincoln, with his craggy features, lanky frame and stovepipe hat, is probably America's most recognizable chief executive, well known for many things, as the great emancipator, as the president who successfully navigated the United States through the Civil War, and as the author of the Gettysburg Address, recited by kids on school stages to this day. Less known is that in his youth, Lincoln was a lean, mean, wrestling machine, who performed feats of strength that became part of local legend and frontier lore. His most famous fight took place shortly after Lincoln, in his early twenties, moved to Salem, Illinois, and was challenged by a local bully named Jack Armstrong. The bout was inconclusive for some time, but when Armstrong resorted to dirty tricks, an enraged Lincoln grabbed him by the neck. With arms extended, Honest Abe shook him like a rag doll, before he tossed him to the ground. He then stood over his rival, and challenged Armstrong's followers, I'm the big buck of this lick. If any of you want to try it, come and wet your horns. Armstrong admitted he'd been fairly beaten, and proclaimed Lincoln the best feller that ever broke into this settlement. The duo shook hands, and became friends. Lincoln was a borderline socialist. Republicans have been traditionally pro-business, and the GOP's has usually been a reliable ally of employers in disputes with labor unions and employees. Surprisingly however the party's first president had some views about labor that could qualify him as a Marxist. In his first speech as an Illinois state legislator in 1837, Abraham Lincoln stated, these capitalists generally act harmoniously and in concert, to fleece the people. In his first annual message to Congress, on December 3, 1861, he wrote, labor is prior to and independent of capital. Capital is only the fruit of labor, and could never have existed if labor had not first existed. Labor is the superior of capital, and deserves much the higher consideration, capital has its rights, which are as worthy of protection as any other rights. Nor is it denied that there is and probably always will be, a relation between labor and capital producing mutual benefits. The error is in assuming that the whole labor of community exists within that relation. A few men own capital, and that few avoid labor themselves, and with their capital hire or buy another few to labor for them. President Lincoln corresponded with Karl Marx. It is most likely that Abraham Lincoln's Marxist views came directly from Karl Marx himself, the author of the Communist Manifesto, and Das Kapital had been a prolific contributor to the New York Daily Tribune. It was the most influential Republican newspaper of the 1850s, when the GOP was founded. In 1848 the Tribune's publisher had invited Marx to become a correspondent, and over the decade that followed Marx, sometimes with the help of Friedrich Engels, wrote over 500 articles for the Republican newspaper. Unsurprisingly, since Marx detested labor exploitation, he became a huge Lincoln fan and cheered him on as he wrecked slavery, the era's most exploitative labor system. In 1864 Marx wrote a letter on behalf of the International Working Men's Association to congratulate Lincoln on his re-election and wish him success in the U.S. Civil War. The president instructed the American ambassador in Britain, where Marx lived, to thank him and let him know that the United States, 
derive new encouragements to persevere from the testimony of the working men of Europe that the national attitude is favored with their enlightened approval and earnest sympathies. A predator who became president? Grover Cleveland is best known today as the only chief executive to have served two non-consecutive terms in the White House. He was elected the 22nd president of the United States in 1884. He served his term then won the popular vote but lost the Electoral College in the 1888 election. Cleveland then bounced back and was elected America's 24th president in 1892. A Democrat reformer, Cleveland left his mark with his tireless efforts to fight the endemic political corruption of his era that earned Cleveland a reputation for political integrity and honesty. That is not the only thing he is known for however, Cleveland was famous or infamous for scandals that would sink any Democrat today. With some exceptions such as with Thomas Jefferson, further down this list, most presidential perversions and scandals involved consensual hanky-panky. That or boorish conduct that amounts to workplace harassment. Inappropriate behavior, but not outright violent criminal conduct. Not so with Grover Cleveland, his biggest scandal involves straightforward sexual assault and extraordinary levels of corruption and abuse of power to cover it up. The only president to have ever personally hanged someone? Grover Cleveland's path to the White House began with a career in the law. He was admitted to the New York Bar in 1859, worked in private practice, and became an assistant district attorney in Erie County, New York in 1863. He ran for district attorney in 1865 and narrowly lost. Five years later, he ran for sheriff of Erie County which included Buffalo and won. The only remarkable thing about his two years as sheriff is that, he personally hanged two murderers sentenced to death, rather than pay a deputy the then customary $10 fee to perform the task. That made Cleveland the only U.S. president known to have personally hanged a man. His most infamous scandal occurred after his term as sheriff ended, and began on the evening of December 15, 1873, with a chance street encounter in Buffalo. That was when Maria Halpin ran into the former sheriff. Cleveland a stocky six-footer who had courted Halpin for months invited her to dinner at a restaurant, and she accepted. After a pleasant meal, he escorted her back to her boarding house, and there the pleasantness stopped. The extraordinary lengths Grover Cleveland went to in order to cover up a scandal. As Maria Halpin stated in a sworn affidavit, a future president assaulted her, by use of force and violence and without my consent, when she said that she would report the assault, she added the former sheriff threatened her into silence. As her affidavit continued, Cleveland told me he was determined to ruin me if it cost him $10,000, if he was hanged by the neck for it. I then and there told him that I never wanted to see him again, and commanded him to leave my room, which he did. A few weeks later, Halpin discovered she was pregnant and in September of 1874, she gave birth to a baby boy, when she declared that Cleveland was the father. The former sheriff used his connections to shut her up. He had the child removed from his mother's care and placed in an orphanage, and had Halpin herself committed to a mental asylum. She was quickly released after an evaluation concluded that she was not insane, and had only been sent there in an egregious abuse of power by corrupt political elites. A candidate elected president despite an epic scandal. Because real life is not fair, and justice and karma are often a joke, Grover Cleveland got away with what he did to Maria Halpin, and went on to bigger things after his failed attempt to have her committed to a mental asylum. The city of Buffalo had grown quite corrupt in the 1870s, and when Republicans nominated a ticket in 1881 that was exceptionally dirty even by the day's low standards, Democrats saw an opportunity. They ran a reform ticket headed by Cleveland for mayor that went on to win the 1881 elections. For mayor of Buffalo, Cleveland was next elected governor of New York. Before he ran for president in 1884, news of the Halpin scandal and his illegitimate child came out in the presidential campaign. Unsurprisingly, opponents attacked Cleveland for the contrast between his do-gooder public persona and his seedy private life. A chant by detractors that mimicked a baby's cry Ma! Ma! Where's my pa? Dog the Cleveland campaign. He won however and his supporters retorted with the counter chant gone to the White House, ha ha ha. A brilliant POTUS with some blind spots. John Quincy Adams, like his father in America's second president John Adams, was a brilliant man before he became chief executive, John Quincy was an exceptionally skilled diplomat perhaps America's best diplomat ever. 
His accomplishments included a stint as ambassador to Russia, and service in the delegation that negotiated an end to the War of 1812. J.Q. Adams also served as Secretary of State, in which capacity he negotiated the acquisition of Florida, and he played a key role in the creation of the Monroe Doctrine. He also served in both the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate, and became one of the early key opponents of slavery. However, although he was clearly an intelligent man, J.Q. Adams had some blind spots, one such was his views about the Hollower theory, a theory that was considered ludicrous even back then. As the name indicates, Hollow Earth posited that our planet is not a solid rock but more like a ball, with concentric layers separated by empty spaces that were probably inhabited by people. Adams not only lent his support to advocates of that balderdash, but actually wanted to help them prove it at the taxpayer's expense. The Hollow Earth Craze the Hollow Earth craze was kicked off by a charlatan named John Cleve Sims Jr., a veteran of the War of 1812. Sims moved to the frontier, where he reinvented himself as a scientist, and became known as the Newton of the West. In 1818 he published Sims Circular No. 1, I declare the Earth is hollow and habitable within, containing a number of solid concentric spheres, one within the other and that it is open at the poles 12 or 16 degrees. I pledge my life in support of this truth and am ready to explore the hollow if the world will support and aid me in the undertaking. Each concentric circle supposedly contained a subterranean world, and all of them were heated and illuminated by a sun-like object at the center of the planet. Sims then hit the lecture circuit, and lobbied the government for an expedition to the poles, where he claimed the entrances to the hollow Earth's interior were located. Educated people laughed off the idea, but it was taken seriously enough by many, and John Quincy Adams lent his support to the proposed Sims expedition. Indeed, he promised to do just that in his successful 1824 presidential campaign, The President and the Mole People. John Quincy Adams lent his support to Simnay's hollow earth theory, and the assumption that the hollow planet's internal concentric spheres must be inhabited by humans, or human-like beings, de facto mole men. J.Q. Adams was interested in natural resources beneath the earth and like Sims. He wanted to establish trade with the Hollow Earth's inhabitants. Backed by heavyweights whose numbers included the president, Sims' expedition actually made it to the agenda of the U.S. House of Representatives and came up for a vote. Fortunately, the proposal was defeated 56 to 46. On the other, and the vote meant that roughly 44% of the country's congressmen wanted to spend taxpayer money to try and contact mole people, the president did not give up. He tried to get Congress to reconsider and did all he could to gather support and resources for the expedition. However, like his father, J.Q. Adams served only one term. He lost the 1828 election to Andrew Jackson, and the newly elected POTUS cancelled the expedition, and abandoned his predecessor's attempts to reach the center of the hollow earth. Which came as no surprise, since Andrew Jackson did not believe that the earth was hollow, he thought it was flat. America's Toughest President as to John Quincy Adams' successor, Andrew Jackson was probably the toughest president in the history of the United States, not necessarily a good person. As a general, Jackson had been all too eager to hang his men for disciplinary infractions at the drop of a hat. He was also the only American president to have made his wealth primarily as a wholesale slave dealer, a career that even many slave owners thought was disreputable. Additionally, he led crusades against the American Indians. All of that horrid behavior and morals aside, we begrudgingly admit Jackson could kick butt and take names. And in his era that could take a man quite far. Jackson began his career in the midst of the American Revolution, when he enlisted in his local militia at age 13. A year later, a 14-year-old Jackson defiantly refused to shine a British officer's shoes, and got slashed with a sword across his face and hand as a result. That left the future president with a seething hatred of the British, and he paid them back in spades at the Battle of New Orleans in 1815. Their Jackson's men killed, wounded, and captured about 2,500 British, while they suffered only 300 casualties of their own.